uh, a big time with that. And I'm so thankful that uh, you're with me, joining me with regards to uh, our study of the book of Acts. But uh, where I want to go with this is, uh, hi, Kelsey, good to see you. I want to, uh, I want to do a little bit of review in just a second, if my thing of a will work. <laughs> there it is. It just took a second. There, see the book? Right there it is. You know, go to Amazon, get you a copy of that sucker. And uh, we're dealing with Acts to the Max. And uh, let's, let's take a moment to review, okay, just really rapidly. Uh, you might recall Luke ends with the ascension of uh, Jesus, and it be Acts begins with the ascension of Jesus, right? And uh, that's Acts chapter 1. Jesus ascends back to heaven. Acts chapter 2, Holy Spirit comes down, thus the, the fire. And the church begins. I hope you can see it. There's little people inside that church building. And so that's supposed to represent the church, not the building, the, the, uh, the people inside the, the building. That's the church. Acts chapter 3, we have the uh, Peter and John going to the temple, the beautiful gate, heal the lame man, etc., which sets us up, by the way, very nicely for Acts chapter 4. Not really very nicely, because what happens in Acts chapter 4 is not very nice at all. But in Acts chapter 4, Peter and John, who did a really good thing for the lame man, right? How long has this guy been, been lame? Since birth. And so Peter and John come along, and they say, hey, we're going to give you a strength in your legs back. That sounds like good news to me, doesn't it sound like good news to you? And it was to everybody except for the folks who were jealous of Jesus. And so the reason Peter and John are going to get in trouble is because they do this in the name of Jesus. Hi, Debbie. Thanks for joining me. Uh, they do this in the name of Jesus, and because they do it in the name of Jesus, guess what? They're going to be pulled in before basically the court system, and they're going to have to give an answer for why are you continuing to bring up the name of Jesus? We thought we had this Jesus guy behind us. You know, we killed him, put him on a cross, so we're done with that. And now you guys continue, you know? What do you got to do to get rid of somebody? Well, Peter and John are going to basically tell them in, in Acts chapter 4 that you're not going to get rid of this one because he's the Messiah, son of God, you killed him, and we're going to have to answer for that. There's my mom. All right, very good. I appreciate mom for joining. Oh, I, I was going to switch the thing, but I guess we got to do one more. Okay, now we do the, uh, what do you call this thing? The memorization. So I'm going to step over here. And that way I'm outside of the way. See? Look at here. All right, Acts chapter 4. Can you see the 4? You see? Okay, there's the 4. It's supposed to be a seat. It's upside down, obviously. And that's supposed to be like a judge or some guy who's, who's sitting there in judgment. Okay? Well, here's our, our verse for Acts chapter 4. Verse 18, so they called them. And commanded them, that's Peter and John, not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. That's the big deal of chapter 4, is that they don't want you to talk in the name of Jesus. I don't think they cared so much. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't think they cared so much about healing the lame man, although they might have. Because you see, these, these guys were just jealous from the beginning to the end that somebody was going to steal their authority, that, that attention was given to somebody else other than them. We're going to find in Acts chapter 4 that these guys are going to recognize that these are untrained men. They didn't go to college. They don't have a Bible degree. Who are they to be talking to us? And their jealousy just it just seeds, it, 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 it ferments. And their jealousy is so rank that I think they probably would have objected. Even if they hadn't healed the lame man, if they'd healed him in some other name. I think they would have objected to that too because they don't want anybody challenging them for power. I think there's a massive application for us today. And that is anybody who is willing to, uh, how shall I say this, compromise on the authority of Scripture in order to have the accolades of men is somebody you need to run quickly away from. Because that's an individual who obviously has his motives in the wrong place. Our motives have to be number one and foremost to please God. And if I, what I have to say, doesn't, you don't like it, that's just too bad. You're going to have to argue with God. Well, that's kind of the approach that Peter and John took here. And so these fellows are going to call them in. They're going to say, what in the world? You healed a lame man. And you did it in the name of Jesus. We, we're telling you, we don't want that to happen anymore. So that's basically the, the, the story of chapter 4, and it's pretty much the entirety of chapter 4. But let me give you a few more details with, your cha with regards to chapter 4. If you've got your Bibles, you might go ahead and open them up there. Uh, verse 1 and following reads, The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. Now, remember, Sadducees are sad, you see, because they don't believe in the resurrection. So the Sadducees had several reasons. Number one, they're jealous of the power that Jesus had and the influence that he had. 
Uh, number two, they don't like it that Jesus' followers are continuing this even after death. And number three, maybe most of all, his followers, Jesus' followers, are continuing this after his death as evidence that Jesus arose from the tomb. They don't like that because, again, Sadducees are sad, you see, because they don't believe in the resurrection. So they gather a bunch of stink, and, and, and etc. It says in verse 3, they seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put him in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to be about 5,000. <laughs> and so they, they seized Peter and John, shove them in jail so that we can talk to them the next day. But because of the persecution that's coming down upon the cross, we now have, coming down upon the church, excuse me, we now have 5,000 that says specifically men. And generally, a man represents a family unit, and so who knows how many it was. So the church is just growing and growing and growing, largely because of persecution. It is my belief that the same thing will happen in America as persecution comes down upon the church. I believe that we're going to find that a lot of folks are going to step up. A lot of folks are going to recognize that they have been traveling the path of convenience and, and compromise, and it's, it's time for them to, to put aside these, these values of the world, and they're going to step up and they're going to repent. And I think a ma many folks are going to, within the church, they're going to turn and they're going to come back to the way. I also believe that there'll be many folks on the outside of the church who are going to recognize that this culture of chaos clearly is not the path I want to take, nor do I want my children to take. And so they're going to be searching for answers. That's when it's our turn, our time to step up. And you're seeing that in this persecution, the church grew. It thrived. It always has. I believe the same thing is coming as far as America is concerned. I think probably the only thing keeping us from that is that we're not persecuted. Uh, I think that one of the things that persecution does, clearly, is it puts everything in perspective. And you, it separates the men from the boys. All of a sudden, you've got to ask yourself, are you more concerned with ingratiating yourself to the world, or are you more concerned with the accolades of heaven? And if you're more concerned with the accolades of heaven, which is going to no doubt bring persecution, Paul says all those who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. And so if you're more concerned with the accolades of heaven, you're going to suffer. You're going to be persecuted. You're going to be pushed aside. You're going to be dismissed, even by those in the church. It certainly happened to the, the, the Jews who were the religious hierarchy of the day. And so we need to be a part of those who are willing to speak the truth, even if it costs us. In the process, two things will happen. Most importantly, we're going to get the blessing of God. But number two, we're going to draw other people to Jesus. That's the pattern of the early church. But as you continue to read on down here, several things are going to happen. But uh, you're, going, you're going to find that uh, Peter is going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. He's going to speak and basically tell the, the rulers that, you know, you killed God again. It's a common theme with Peter, as you can imagine. And obviously, it would have been a common theme. Um, we're, we're just within a few months, evidently, probably, of, of the, the, the death of Jesus. Verse 13, And when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. This is maybe one of the most powerful passages in all the Bible. Verse 13. Acts 4.13. Write that one down. Circle it three times. In this passage, these, these bigwigs, these folks who have, they've been off to seminary. They've been off to their version of college, and, and they've got their Bible degrees hanging on the wall, and so they're big and bad, and they know all of the answers. They look up and they recognize that these two guys, they're just common, ordinary fellas. They've not been to school. How can they possibly come in here and speak with such power? But they draw the conclusion, which is radically powerful for you and I to draw today as well, and that is this. They took note that they had been with Jesus. Hear me, please. The most important thing for you to do is to be with Jesus. I am really concerned, and the, the second segment here, we're going to talk about home, establishing home churches, and I'm really concerned that some of the folks who are going to push back on home churches are going to push back because they're so in love with their grand cathedrals, and they're in love with the power structure that would suggest to you that unless you've got a PhD in Bible, unless you've got a master's degree in Bible, unless you've been off to seminary, whatever it may be, that you, you don't have the information, so you, you can't teach us about the Bible. That's not what they said here. Individuals who were willing to submit to God were used by God. Then you say, well, yeah, but these guys were inspired by the Holy Spirit. So can you be. That's what, the, this, is what this book is. It's the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Just get in it and study it. I have recently been greatly discouraged. 
I, I probably know five or six young men who I have watched over my lifetime who have gone off specifically to graduate school. And it's just ruined them. It's just because they're as they go off, they they all of a sudden they get full of themselves and, and they get full of their their own abilities and and they, they feel like they're just a little bit above everyone else because they know this that and the other and their their interpretive skills become so liberal and so out there that they begin to they begin to replace scripture and reinterpret scripture. I'm so very very concerned with with this hierarchy of a, of, a, of a setting we have even in today's world with regards to we're only going to trust those individuals who have gone off to be trained by men. No. Trust individuals who have gone, gone off to be trained by God. Are you a student of the Word? Then you can be just like that fisherman called Peter. You can be just like these, these untrained men who are being referred to here. You can be just like John. They were untrained, and this astonished them. And the thing that they recognize is the only way they could have this information is they had been with Jesus. Amen. 13 times. Amen. 13 and 4. No, 4 and 13. I got that back. 4 and 13. That's your verse. Circle that up. All right. Continuing on here, it's going to go on to say that basically what's going to happen is they're going to call them in. They're going to say, listen, you've got to stop this. Verse 18. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or to teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, I love this, judge for yourselves whether it is right to obey, whether judge for yourselves whether it is right in God's sight to obey you rather than God. We cannot help but speak what we have seen and we have heard. God has worked so powerfully in our lives that we've got to tell it. That's the testimonial. That's, that's when you present to the world the journey that you have had. God has changed me. And therefore, I have a message for you. And it doesn't matter if you're going to persecute me. It doesn't matter if you're going to throw me in jail. But it doesn't change the story. He's still God. He's still on the throne. And he has still worked mightily in my life. I'm planning to tell you about it. Well, on their release, Peter and John, they go back to the people. They report all that that had happened. And basically, you know what happens? The people are happy. They're thrilled. Similar passage is going to happen. We're talk- they're just thrilled that they are worthy to, to suffer for the cause of God. And it's an amazing time. Then as you conclude the chapter, all the believers were in one heart and mind. No one claimed that uh, any of his possessions were his own, but they shared everything that they had. As we conclude chapter 4, it's going to be a a real important setup for chapter 5 because somebody's going to be died. Going to be died. (laughs) Somebody's going to die in Acts chapter 5. They're actually going to be executed by God himself in Acts chapter 5 because they lied to the Holy Spirit. And it has to do with this this whole thing of sharing your stuff. The very last two verses of chapter 4 say this. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas. He's going to come up, very prominent character in the book of Acts. First partner of Paul, uh, the leader of the first missionary journey. Paul actually follows Barnabas off on the first missionary journey. Quickly in there, we're going to see a transition to where it seems like Paul steps up and he becomes the primary. But Barnabas is a very, very important fellow. Well, this Barnabas guy, which means, by the way, son of encouragement, this Barnabas guy, it says he sold a field that he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Well, that's going to set up a trend. And uh, that's the opening illustration, at least, of a trend that is going to play out in chapter 5. In chapter 5, others are going to say, well, we want to do the same thing. We've got a lot of stuff. And so this thing called Christianity, it's not about materialism and, and, you know, gorging ourselves, being gluttonous on materialism. And so they began to sell their stuff so that others who didn't have could have. In that process, we're going to get two people, Ananias and Sapphira, and... uh, they, uh, well, you'll just have to tune in next week because it, it's not good. God's going to execute these two because they uh, uh, they lied to God. All right, that's chapter four. Let's see what else I got to do here. See, like there's something. Oh, yeah, we got to do the doodle. Uh, same thing, Acts 4. Have your students draw a picture that illustrates a, a favorite part or invent a better picture for Acts chapter four. So make sure you do the doodle. And then now I'll step way out of here because this you'll want to take a picture of. I have no idea how many of those I answered, but again, you see here, you got the references, so look them up on your own. Be a good Bible student. Teachers, get out your cameras, take a picture of that, because I'm fixing to give you the second five. Now, here's your first five leading questions. And again, I've told you repeatedly, notice that in Acts, I've also provided a leading question to kind of make application. Why is the resurrection so important to Christians? That's designed to not just answer a Bible question, but to help tie it to your heart. Got that?
All right, and now we got the, the second five. There are 10 in each thing, as you know. And so here you go. Last question. What Levite from Cyprus was also named Joseph and called the son of encouragement? I bet you can answer that one right now. Uh, but here's your application. Consider what each of these things reveals about that man. And uh, do you have them working in your life as well? <laughs> All right, you got that? You took a picture of it? You say, no, your head's in the way. Okay, I'll step out one, one more time. There you go. Take a picture. Got it? All right, very good. Let's enter into our prayer time. And uh, one of the reasons I'm kind of moving on is because uh, I get to go hear my son preach again this morning. I'm really excited about it. Gabriel will be preaching at the Evening Star Church of Christ, which is about 30 minutes from here. And so as quick as I get done here, I'm going to jump in the car. We're going to pedal over there. And he's got a new sermon that I'm anxious to hear. Got several folks who are coming in who have already told us that they're going to come in from various places to hear my boy. And I'm excited about it. So let's have prayer time, and then I'll move into the sermon time after that. Uh, Kanita, good friend. Hopefully be with her this morning. Uh, she's one of those who supports my little boy and comes and hears him preach, and I love her very much. Kanita, God willing, will be with us. But remember, Kanita several weeks ago lost her husband, and she has now moved to Arkansas. Still have a lot of things that are unfinished up there that uh, needs to be taken, uh, taken care of in Indiana. And so you might remember her and her family as they're trying to pack things up and move it all down here, etc. cetera. Um, Again, Debbie's friends, uh, one with leukemia, the other had a stroke, and we continue to have them on our prayer list. John from Illinois, haven't had an update on John. I wish I, I'd like to hear if he's out of the hospital. Sure, I surely he is by now, but continue to pray for John. My boy, Gabriel, who will be preaching, so proud of this young man. He's only 17, uh, but uh, really a phenomenal preacher, and I'm thankful to be able to sit and listen to him and his insights. Let's go back one. Regina. Uh, her uh, health in Illinois, good, another good friend. In fact, these two attend the same congregation. Remember her. Love her very much. And then Hallmark and Chick-fil-A. Hallmark and Chick-fil-A. Uh, some of you may have picked up on the fact that last week I just completely skipped over last day's live completely. I got distracted, to be honest with you. Uh, we, had a, we had an in-home house church kind of a party going on, and I, I forgot all about it. But if you'll stick with me, God willing, tomorrow I will address this subject, tomorrow night at 8 o'clock, uh, Hallmark specifically. Uh, most of you know that Hallmark uh, aired a commercial that had a homosexual kiss going on, and a lot of folks were up in arms about that. A lot of folks signed a petition. I was one of them, etc. Well, they have taken that commercial down now. I'm not accepting, uh, not, not going to run that commercial. I'm told that, all, that they're really under pressure to start broadcasting more homosexual scenes in their movies, etc. I'm concerned that Hallmark's going to go the same way as Chick-fil-A. I had a lot of folks who were really upset at me that I was upset at Chick-fil-A, and yet we're finding as this, this thing plays out that Chick-fil-A was not only guilty in their compromise in that case, but Chick-fil-A has been has evidently been compromising evidently for, for some time now. But I'm concerned that Hallmark's going to go the way of Chick-fil-A. Even though we as Christians stand up, even though we as Christians support them, even though we as Christians are, you know, we're there for them, all those kind of things when they make moral decisions, I expect that they'll go the way of Chick-fil-A. And I, that really, really concerns me. So let's pray that Hallmark will have more of a backbone than Chick-fil-A. All right. So there's your prayer list. Let's see if I had another one. I think that was it. Okay. So I'm going to leave those up. And again, I'm probably going to be five minutes early on my sermon time, but need to do that so I can go with my boy to hear him preach. So I'm going to leave this up for just a second while I go over here and transition. I'm going to get a drink of water first, if you don't mind. My throat's a little raspy. <laughs> oh my.
Good morning! We're going to jump right into our sermon time this morning. If you're concerned that uh, as you're viewing this, you're saying, oh man, I'm a little bit late. You're not really late. I'm jumping in there early because I want to go hear my boy preach this morning. And uh, so in order to do that, i got to get it all in. And i got a lot to cover this morning. And so you can pedal backwards in my feed and you can, you can watch it uh, as a recording or whatever if you're tuning in late. But uh, this morning, we're going to talk, Lord's Day Live, we're, we're talking about a subject matter that's on my heart. And that is the home church reality. The home church reality. Those of you who have been with me so far, you know that we have, uh, in our first time together, we talked about the introduction, and I told you how it vitally important women are to the home church reality, because women are called to be the homemakers. Women are naturally created by God to be the nurturers of, of, the, of our world, and so it, it just makes a lot of sense, and, and you might recall, in fact, let's do, let's do this really quick. You might recall, I gave you that long list of passages all of these passages where they had some kind of a church gathering, a church moment, a holy time that occurred within the home. And remember, I pointed out to you, I don't even list in here 1 Timothy chapter 3 where it talks about homes. That's the elders need to be uh, good caretakers of their homes in order for them to be an elder. I don't even talk about Titus chapter 2 in this one that, that deals with uh, you know women are, are called to be homemakers. I don't even have in this list 1 Timothy chapter 5 that talks about older women who are allowed to be taken into the number because they are impressive women. And how? why are they impressive? Because they were dedicated to their husband and because they raised children. I don't even have those. This is just a list of passages about times where there was a church gathering in homes. Isn't that impressive? Women are essential to the home church reality because women are the ones who are assigned the job of making sure that the home scenario is working well. Well, what I want to do this morning is I want to talk to you about the second area. We had, first of all, the introduction. Then last week we talked about the apostles' teachings. That's Bible study, and we talked about that. So pedal back if you need to in the, in the series and, and look at that as to how you can practically apply Bible study in a home church scenario. This morning we're going to look at the second one, which is the fellowship. Uh, how, the, how did they go about that? And of course, if you're paying attention, then next time, bread, which I believe is communion, prayer, how do you do that in a home church, and then how do you share in a home church? We'll talk about those. What I've been doing is I've been trying to give you a real time, let's see if you can see how I did that, see watch see, there, see that, <laughs> a real time moment with regards to each of these subjects. Last time it was Bible study, this time it's fellowship. What does fellowship involve? Well, I want to take you to one passage specifically, and we'll pick this apart. It's a really remarkable passage. In the book of Acts, which is the history of the early church, you find this happening. You find early on in Acts chapter 2 that they were all about meeting in the homes. It's true that every once in a while they had their meetings in the temple. I, you know, I get that as well, that that happened. But it certainly was not the universal pattern because there's only one temple. And folks like this guy who lives in Philippi, they can't go every week to the temple. And so how did they meet? The universal pattern was that they met within the homes, right? Well, in Acts 16, Paul and Silas are going to be beat. And they're going to be put in prison, in jail. Which, by the way, back in the day, probably was a little more than a cave in the side of a hill or something. It, it wasn't a nice scenario. And uh, they're going to be put in jail because they have healed somebody or they, they've exercised a demon. And since they have they've taken this into, their, into God's hands and they've done something good, but it offset something that others didn't, it offset something that was going on in their culture that others didn't like, um, we're, we're seeing that they're, they're not only persecuted, they're put in jail, and that whole jail scenario is about to tumble in on them, or at least it seems so with regards to the Philippian jailer. You might recall at midnight, they're singing and praying, and the earth shakes, and the chains come off, and the walls, you know, and it, it just looks like the entire earth is going to fall in on them. And the jailer is concerned that the prisoners are going to escape. And so the jailer has drawn his sword. He's about to fall on it, about to kill himself. And Paul says, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Because we're still all here. The jailer rushes in and he asks Paul and Silas, what in the world? How in the world can you fellas be singing and praying at midnight? What kind of hope do you have? I want what you got. 
Paul tells him the story of Jesus. He explains to him the gospel message. And then we have these results. Now again, our subject matter is fellowship. It's not so much the conversion of the Philippian jailer. I get that. But I want you to see the the lead up to this, and now what happens with regards to fellowship, and how that it happens within the home, and how that you and I can have the same kind of a dynamic in our homes if we'll allow it to take place. Notice the passage. At that hour of the night, what hour of the night? Well, well it's at midnight when they're singing and praying, so it's sometime after midnight. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds, then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house. Where'd they go? Into his house. So the jailer is bringing the two two prisoners into his house. He's washed their wounds. They're in the house now. And again, we're dealing with that home church reality. So we're in the house now. Brings them to his house. Sets a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God. He and his whole household. Three things with regards to fellowship that I don't want you to miss in this real application or this real example of fellowship in the early church. Number one, notice that there was always harmony. Fellowship requires that. It's almost it's almost a given that you don't have fellowship with somebody if, if you're not to some degree in harmony with them. Fellowship implies that we found common ground. And therefore, because we have found common ground, we're going to celebrate around that common ground. I'm going to suggest to you that they had this baptism common ground, which unfortunately is so underemphasized in in the Christian world today. Have you noticed that? There are a lot of churches that will tell you it's okay to get baptized, but it's certainly not essential. It's certainly not necessary. And yet, if you study the New Testament pattern and you push man's opinion aside and just go with what the book says, you find that throughout the book of Acts, it was always necessary for them to be baptized. Acts chapter 16, we got the Philippian jailer. And as we see the Philippian jailer, as he comes to understand that these men have hope that I want to have, how in the world are you singing and praying at midnight? Because we know Jesus. Well, I want to know that Jesus. And Paul, excuse me, is going to explain to him, well, one of the things that has to happen is you've got to die to yourself, be buried with Christ, rise and walk in newness of life. Paul will write that in Romans 6, 3, and 4. And the jailer says, I want that. And so notice what happens. Immediately, they're all washed up, and immediately the household and and the jailer, excuse me, are are baptized. Amazing story. So the first thing you've got to have is you've got to have harmony. Now, I want you to see this. I've done this before in other series. Series? What's the plural series? Whatever. I've, I've done this before. But the Fellowship of the Rings... Uh, you can look for this elsewhere in, in some of my stuff, and you'll, you'll find it. But I just want to briefly touch on this with regards to this whole idea of baptism and why it was essential to the fellowship. Back in John chapter 3, this is a long time prior to what the passage is that we're talking about in Acts 16. But back in, that, in John chapter 3, Jesus is still on the planet, and he's got a conversation with a Pharisee. His name is Nicodemus. And Nicodemus is going to come to him, and Nicodemus is going to have some questions, etc. But the reason I call it the fellowship of the rings is because it's interesting the journey that Nicodemus is going to be called upon to take with regards to knowing Jesus. He's supposed to be journeying all the way to the center of the rings. It's not until he gets here that he is in full fellowship. That's our topic this morning, right? Full fellowship. But notice what Jesus is going to say. Jesus came to Jesus at night and he said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs that you're doing unless God was with him. Jesus replied, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. Born again. That's part of the fellowship. You got to, if we want to have common ground, we've all got to be born again. Now, or how can somebody be born when they're old? Nicodemus says, Surely you cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb. Jesus is going to answer him, Verily truly, I say to you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. I am convinced that that's baptism and the receiving of the Holy Spirit that Peter himself is going to say in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you're missing your sins, and you receive what? The gift of the Holy Spirit. In Acts 2 and 38, you got both things happening. They're baptized with water, and they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. I think that that's what happens. That's why Peter preaches that on the day of Pentecost, because he learned it from Jesus. But the reason for this slide is to show you the journey that Nicodemus was required to go through. But at this, at least at present, in this passage, he wasn't really to get ready to go there. First of all, the first ring is you're journeying towards the center of fellowship. The first ring is that you've got to acknowledge the one true God. Islam does not get here. 
Muslims are not here. They do not acknowledge the one true God. They acknowledge Allah, who is not our Jehovah, and one of the reasons we know that is because their Allah says plainly in the Quran, I've read it from cover to cover, says plainly in the Quran several times that Allah does not have a son, doesn't want a son, and anybody who acknowledges Allah as having a son is worthy of damnation. My God, Jehovah, on the other hand, says I have a son and I'm very pleased, and I'll allow my son to die for you. Allah and Jehovah are not the same God. And so they're out here. First level of, a, of fellowship is that they are individuals who at least acknowledge the same God. Nicodemus was willing to do that. But he doesn't go into the second rank. Jesus says the second level is you've got to acknowledge me as the Christ, the Messiah. The one that was sent from God. Now, I'm not going to go there. I'll call you a teacher, but you're not the Messiah, not the Son of God. And then the third area, notice this, and Jesus is going to say, if you want to enter the kingdom, you've got to be born of the water and the spirit. I'm convinced that that's baptism. Let's, let's pedal backwards. Maybe. I'm convinced that that's baptism. Where is it? Come on. There it is. Baptism. Back to our text now. So you're supposed to be baptized in order to have fellowship. We have a harmony. The most intimate harmony you can have with anybody in your home church is a harmony based upon a new birth. They, these individuals have died to themselves, been buried to rise and walk in newness of life. Quick application. I'm going long, so I've got to run through this. Quick application. Back in the day, in fact, it even happens today, but back in the days primarily, when an individual wanted to change lifestyles, baptism was around before Christianity. The Jews did it for, for a long time. If a person wanted to become a Jew, they had to die to themselves and in that dying to themselves, dying to their ancient paths, they would be baptized. Jesus is going to take that same scenario and he is going to say, I'm not interested in you becoming a Jew. I'm interested in you becoming like me. I want you to be mine. And so just as I died, just as I was buried, just as I rose again on the third day, I want you to do the same thing. That's what baptism means to the Christian. And so when a Christian was baptized back in the day, and even today on occasion, they literally turned their back on their former life and oftentimes their family who did not want them to be Christians. Oftentimes their family would, would actually conduct a funeral. And it was just like they were dead to them. Like they had died and gone on and no longer part of the family. Baptism back in the day was a moment when there was a great change. It was not some kind of an optional moment. It was not some kind of a, let's just wait until we get a whole bunch of people, you know, at the end of the month, and then we'll have some kind of a baptismal service. It was urgent. They did it immediately. They got after the business. Uh, 22 and 16, Acts. 22 and 16, same thing happened with regards to Paul, who was Saul at the time. Um, he, uh, rise and be baptized. Why, what are you waiting for? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins. It was something that was done immediately. And the reason is because this whole concept of dying to your past, dying to the old man of sin, has to happen. If you want to go into the presence of God, you've got to become a new creature. And therefore, baptism was essential. Rapidly. Fellowship involved harmony. The greatest level of fellowship that you can have within your home church is going to be based upon the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Number two. Let's see if I move past these. There it is. Number two. It's not only going to be harmony, but it's also going to be the home. Harmony involves harmony, home. By the way, number three is going to have an H as well. Harmony, home. Watch the, the, the emphasis on home in, in, in our passage here. Notice that he's immediately going to take them, wash their wounds, and the household is going to be baptized. doesn't say it specifically, but it sounds like that he took them to, their, to his house, and the household was part of the whole process of taking care of these men. Okay, the home scenario, household, the jailer brought them into his house. And then you see household down here for the third time uh, at the end of the, uh, our little paragraph. And so the emphasis on home, again, sticks out, does it not? Fellowship involves the home. I've probably preached this too much in this series, but hear, hear it again. One of the reasons I believe the church is struggling is because we are so enamored with our, our cold cathedrals, where there is no personal accountability. And so I pull in, I park in my own traditional pew, looking at the back of the head of the fellow in front of me, and there's no real engagement, maybe a handshake on the way out the door, maybe a few words of greeting, just kind of small talk, that kind of a thing. But as far as real intimacy, as far as accountability is concerned, nobody's sitting on my couch. 
Nobody's looking around the room at, at the pictures on my wall. Nobody is, you know, engaged in, in eating supper at my dining room table. This is kind of a cold, it's a meeting place, it's just like an old hall that we go over there, you know, and we do our business and we get out of there. It's kind of like a club. It's a social event without the intimacy. We are called to do things in the home according to example and according to command. I'm convinced. I think that's one of the reasons that women are, are called to, to be a, a establishers of, of home, of the home life. And so you've got the example that is happening here, household, house, household. You've got the whole idea that fellowship happened in the home because that's the best place for fellowship to take place. Sit on my front porch. Drink a cup of coffee with me. Look at my yard. Yeah, I should have probably mowed it yesterday, but it rained, and so I wasn't able to get to it. And we can have that conversation. And I've got that accountability rather than taking you off to some cold cathedral. So the second part of fellowship is they weren't just in harmony with regards to the death, burial, and resurrection. This is what I identify. I have been born again. I am committed. I'm into this church that we're talking about here. It's also that, that there's a home scenario going on. And then number three, harmony, home, and hospitality. Harmony, home, and hospitality. You notice the word meal here. Isn't that interesting? That uh, you're going to take him probably to his house to wash them up. Doesn't say specifically, but he is going to wash their wounds. That's hospitality. There's going to be a baptism that takes place, and then there's going to be a lot of joy, a lot of rejoicing. And as part of that joy, they're going to have a meal. So they're going to sit together and they're going to have a meal. Does that sound like Acts chapter 2? Yeah, it does, because that's what they were doing in the beginning. Right out the gate, 3,000 baptized, what's the first thing that we see them doing? Getting together on a daily basis, doing, having fellowship, taking uh, part as far as the, the fellowship uh, of, uh, of the apostles' doctrine and teachings, and also they are having fellowship in each other's homes as they eat together meals. Fellowship involves hospitality. It's one of the reasons I'm really concerned for the church today because so many of us are not very hospitable. And I don't mean that to be necessarily mean-spirited, but you think about it. I think that's why we are so in love with our church buildings is because I don't really have to be hospitable in my church building. In fact, I'm probably paying somebody to clean up after me. And so hospitality does not thrive in a cold cathedral. Hospitality thrives in a home that has harmony. So you put these three together and you begin to understand what fellowship was to the early church and how obviously significant <coughs> excuse me, it should be to you and I. Now on this point of hospitality, let me show you two passages that I think are just phenomenal that I, I'm not sure how church leaders are, are, are missing these two passages. But I want you to see both of these. First of all, let me, uh, I'll step over here first of all. 1 Timothy chapter 3. This is a passage about elders, shepherds, leaders in the church. These are the qualifications. This is what needs to happen. You'll notice I circled hospitality. Leaders in the church, are these overseers are to be above approach, faithful to his wife. Notice the family emphasis here. Temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospital, able to teach, not given to drugs, not violent, not, not quarrelsome, not lover of money. He must manage his own family well. Two things that are obvious here. One is this whole idea of family. Can you see that? Family. And family almost always identifies with what? The home. That We're back to home church reality. Okay. But notice the hospitality idea here. He's got to be hospitable. For a man to be outstanding in the church, these are the upper echelon of men. These are the men who have proven themselves. These are, these are the individuals that rise to the level of being able to, to actually serve as shepherds and elders. They have to be hospitable. And hospi hospitality almost always identifies to some level with home. Watch this. <laughs> I don't know what happened to my slide. I think I failed to move that thing up there. And I'm not sure that I can. So I'm not, well, I'm not going to take the time to do it. And I can't circle it on the thing. Anyhow, maybe that'll just give extra emphasis to this passage. Let me scoot over here. 1 Timothy chapter 5. This is an outstanding man. This is an outstanding woman. Watch. No widow may be put on the list of widows unless she is over 60. We're dealing with women who don't have anybody to care for them. And so when does the church step up? And when does the church say, okay, we'll take them into the number and we will support them? Well, they've got to be outstanding women, he's going to say here, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. They need to be into, these need to be upper echelon kind of women. These need to be the most admirable types of women if the church is going to begin paying their bills. Well, what does the most admirable type of a woman look like? I'm glad you asked. 
He goes on to say, these widows have to be at least over 60, has been faithful to her husband. Notice again the emphasis on home life. Faithful to her husband and is well known for her good deeds, such as bringing up children. Notice the emphasis on the home life. And then lastly, this circle is supposed to be over here, showing hospitality. Notice that in both of these, we've got hospitality going on. If you're an outstanding man in the church, you're supposed to be hospitable. If you're an outstanding woman in the church, you're supposed to be hospitable. And in both of these passages, it's specifically connected to the home life. So what's the application that you and I should be able to draw as far as the harmony of Scripture? Obviously, it is this. Home life is essential to the growth of the church. Home church reality. Bring people into your home and be hospitable. You want to be an outstanding man in the church? Be hospitable. You want to be an outstanding woman in the church? Establish a home, Titus 2 and 5, in which you and your husband can be hospitable. Follow the example of Aquila and Priscilla, having churches meet of the church meet in their home. This is the biblical pattern, but it's not the pattern that is predominant in the church today. And it's unfortunate, and I believe that it is the reason that we are struggling as a church today as far as growth is concerned. And again, I, I can't say it too much. Can you not see the absolute essential nature of women? Throughout the entire biblical timeline, women are the ones who have been called to identify most with the family, to take care of building the home, to be in charge, to manage the home. And in so doing, they then open up so many wonderful doors as far as the church is concerned, as far as hospitality is concerned, as far as our subject matter fellowship is concerned. So by way of review, there they are. They had harmony because they all had committed to this church. They committed to the bride of Christ. They committed to Jesus in such a way that they were willing to actually die and start all over again. That's what baptism is. So there was harmony. They did it in the house. They did it in their home. And then lastly, they had hospitality that was being shown. And so your real example of this whole idea of fellowship here in Acts chapter 16, your real example plays out with those three points. Harmony, home, and hospitality. Can you establish a home church? Absolutely. The most important, absolutely most important, hands down, most important essential characteristics of a home characteristic of a home church is this. You're willing to do it as the New Testament church did it according to Scripture. If you're willing to do that and abide by the scriptures, it doesn't matter what, it doesn't matter how many you got, doesn't matter what kind of, you know, uh, living room setting you're putting people in, do it the way the early church did it, and you can establish a home church reality. And I believe, I am, I'm confident, that this is not only the future of the church, it is what has to happen in order for the church to survive and to thrive here in America today. Suggestions, really quickly, on things, I'm going to ask you to just take a picture of this. I've gone long this morning. Celebrate the natural, the not the non-awkward. Think about our cold cathedrals. Much of what we do in our cold cathedrals is kind of awkward. It's not natural. Promote dependence upon each other. Take time to discuss common interests. That's where you're going to gain fellowship. Take trips together. That's one of the things I think that would be most important for you. Just pack up and go somewhere. That's where you really get to know people. And obviously, according to this, what we saw in this example in Acts chapter 16, eat meals together. <laughs> Anyhow, there you go. Cindy asks, are these uh, saved on my site? And uh, they are saved. You can go to my YouTube channel. Uh, best thing for you to do is actually go down here. And uh, top right-hand corner, I think it says audio video. And you can go there and it'll tell you, it'll direct you how to get to these. But yeah, they're being saved there. And uh, eventually I'll put them all together on a uh, flash drive and make them available to those who want to have them. But home church reality. I believe that it needs to be the reality of the present day church. Let's get back there. I think that I think that God will bless us if we do. This is Sonny Child saying, be there, Matthew 16, 26.